Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. You already know. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, share the video, leave a comment. And if you haven't already grabbed the book, grab the book. Blood on the Razor Wire. Today, I got a special guest at a bunch of time in maximum security federal prisons in the country. But I'm going to let him introduce himself and tell you a little bit about his situation, where he's from. And how he ended up in federal prison. Tell the people who you are, brother. How you doing, Chad? I'm Fred. Um, you hear me good? Yep. Um, well, just like any man can easily get caught up in the feds for the simplest thing, I was caught up. Um, but my story's a little different, brother. It's it's all good. How much time were you sentenced to? I was sentenced to five years. I ended up doing six years, just over six years. And some people might be listening and say, oh, six years, that ain't nothing. But where'd you do your time at? USP Hazleton. USP Hazleton. So they sent you to Hazleton with a six-year sentence, one of the most dangerous prisons in the country. Yeah, with a six-year sentence. And wait till I tell you the charge. Tell well, Don't tell me. Tell the people. <laughs> I was... As a result of misinformation from the state of Louisiana reporting to the nation via NCIC, Louisiana reports that I am a first degree convicted murderer. As a result, I've had a lifetime of fun trying to get it clear off my record. Nevertheless, before that, I would get into a situation where the feds would get involved. Uh, because they thought I had crossed state line with my children, which I did. It's not a crime unless you're considered a fugitive, first degree convicted murderer from Louisiana. So that's how I ended up in the feds. Um, and the story goes, you know, they 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 misinform they 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 have misinformation, and so they brought me through to trial. And even when the informa information came back. As, as, as uh, false and fraudulent, they didn't stop. Uh, the feds would go as far as to prove their point that I was a bad guy the day I was arrested by the feds. They came in and took my two sons from my wife because she was making a bad decision for being a first degree convicted murderer with a long criminal history, which I don't have. Nevertheless, I'm sitting in jail waiting to go before the feds. And I talked to my wife once. She tells, I didn't know this, but she tells me as soon as I left, the feds came in and DCF came and took the kids. I freaked out. I told I told my wife, I said, look, I don't care what you tell them. Tell them anything. You get those babies. So I'm sitting in jail all this time. They got my kids from my wife. I finally get to trial date. Now I've told my wife to go ahead and you do what you do and say what you gotta do. So two hours before my hearing, my attorney shows up and says, Hey, I can't represent you. I said, What do you mean you can't represent me? He says, The feds got to her. They got to her. I said, To who? Oh, they got to your wife. She's gonna testify against you. Well, I didn't say nothing. I knew what I had told my wife to do. I didn't give a shit because I knew it had to move forward or they were going to keep my kids. So I made an option. I said, well, I'll represent myself. We're going to do this today. I wanted to move it. It had already been 120 days that they taken my kids from my wife because I'm a dangerous convicted murderer. So I brought mine to trial. I, said, I wish I'd known the things I know now, but I didn't. And when I tell you that the federal government unequivocally will lie, drum up stuff, it's, un, it's unfathomable the things that they will do to get a conviction. And my point to all this is, if you're out there doing dirt and you think that they won't hem you up, you got another question coming, brother. I've read some of the story. I've read some of the motions that you filed, and, and you know people are probably like, "What? You go to jail for that?" 
I mean, it's outrageous what the government does. You know, when I read some of the stuff, that, the pro se filings that you had before we did the interview. So even me, when I first started, I was like, what? It was a crazy thing. But they do vicious things. Now, you ended up in Hazleton, right? One of the most dangerous prisons in the country, USP Hazleton. That's right. Were you over there when the independents got into it with uh, Ohio Chance, the Ohio AB, and the, the yeah, independents, uh, sure. the independents got talking, the upper hand? Well, there's a couple guys. Uh, Joe Dirt, um, Patch. Um, there's, I won't call them. I'm not going to put the names out there like that, but there were a couple of them. And right before that incident, let me, let me back up tell you my story entry into the feds mind you i i'm not a i'm not a goody two shoes but I, I wasn't out in that game i wasn't in that in that role so i didn't know what i was walking into i walked in totally blind I, i'm a man i can walk wherever i want not understanding how serious these usps are it doesn't matter it doesn't matter you can die like that and people don't understand that and what I mean by that is as soon as I was transferred into the feds and transferred to MDC Brooklyn, I was there three days and watched the first guy die. And just like that, they locked him down. Three days later, we back up. Business as usual. And it happens. Were you, were you shocked, man? Were you shocked that they sent you to a USP? Well, I didn't know I was going to the USP until I got to MDC Brooklyn. So there I got to hear all the horror stories. And not that I'm not, I'm not, I'm not nobody, but I got, I'm a, I got a clean jacket. I'm a man. I, I, okay, I'm going to be all right. So I went, I'll be honest, not cocky in any way, shape, form, but not concerned, if you understand what I'm saying. Because well, I, mean, I didn't, again, I didn't understand how bad the USP was. I was at a transfer spot. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I mean, it, a, go ahead. Go ahead. It's shocking to walk into a USP and say, wow, this is federal prison. People are getting killed here. People are getting stabbed. I mean, were you shocked to a certain extent? It, oh, absolutely. I was stunned because, and, I, and I'm going to tell you why, because life is taken there so quickly and for some of the most trivial, trivial, trivial stuff, gone. Your life is gone. Let me tell you a story. When we pulled in, there was like 23 of us. We get off the bus, we go to R and D, that's the intake, they do everything. And before we walked out that door, the lieutenant turned around and said, Let me explain something, fellas. If you ain't right, don't go out there. I can't I can't help you. When you walk out that door, there's a there's a captain's office on the right. If you need to check in, check in. I'm at the front of the line, so I'm just kind of doing my thing. By the time we got to the first gate, I looked back, there were five of us. 23 guys got off the bus. So when I hear people say, you know, oh, they only get four or five people, they get more, but about 20 of them check in because it's they're scared. What's one of the worst things you've seen at USP Hazleton? Oh, my Lord. Uh, where you want to go with it? I could, I could tell you. I watched him cut a guy, slit a guy's stomach open, dig out of his guts looking for the uh, bags of heroin. If he, that's what you want to hear, I could tell you. I watched the, and I'm not into, you know, I was. They have Serenios. You have all of these cars, and I could tell you where the whites, Odinus, had got into it with the Indians, and. They said it was one of the worst, well-calculated slaughters that they'd ever seen. And that happened at Hazleton. Let's talk um, about, listen, it's not about what story I want to hear. It's about your experiences because I'm going somewhere with it as we right, move right. along. So well, we, let's talk about let's talk about the Odinus in the Native American car. They said it was calculated. So who was on the winning end? The Indians. The Indians. They put it together. And, and, and they did what they had to do, huh? Well, when you understand when I say this, back in the day when they used to have their uh, walk time, the CO would sit at, stand out in the hall. Like 12 engines crept into the cells and waited for these dudes to come out. It was like three of them. And they mastered, mastered them. 
I was just, there was blood everywhere. I've watched two Spanish guys in a cell fight to the death. Both of them died in the cell, blood everywhere. I've seen some of the most horrible shit I could, that people can imagine. The shit they see on TV, excuse my words, ain't nothing to what real life is in these penitentiaries. And, and, and that's where I'm going with it, right? Seeing that stuff, I mean, now, today, you're a father, you're a husband, you know, you're living your best life. I mean, I see some of the stuff that you're doing because we've talked a few times. Usually, I don't well, talk sure. to people before I do interviews, but me and you, we talked a little bit. And being that you were in that environment and to come out here into the real world, do you think that seeing those things affected you mentally and emotionally? Oh, on levels that people don't even understand. The, let me put it this way and, and look at that the, the human psychology man's not wasn't built to, to to destroy man that's not our intention we do it out of self-preservation it's the normal now don't get me wrong there's some people in that that was messed up in the head but for the most part it's not normal for a man to see that type of stuff and to experience it and 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 stand two feet next to it, and then literally jump over it to get to to the ice bucket and to the to the store man before they lock it down. It's uh, unfortunately it, it makes you a very callous person to to just normal stuff. And that's the point I was going to ask you: Do you become numb to the violence, to the hatred, to the anger that you see on a daily basis? Does it just become part of your day? Well, for me, brother, I walked a real different line. When I went in there, uh, I just went in as a, as a white man. Um, but after I was established and people understood that I was a solid white boy, I walked a Christian walk. So it kind of put me in a different uh, mindset when viewing things. Um, not that I condoned or participated in but uh there was a lot of things that needed to happen and it's unfortunate that it happened but it happens there's some scummy people out there and they deserve what they get brother how old how old were you when you were in, the, in that prison when i went in i was let's see how this is 2008 40 45 something like that i was see. an older guy yeah, you're, you're an older guy. You're 45 years old. You've experienced a lot of things in life. And you end up in probably, in 08, probably one of the most dangerous federal prisons in the country. In 2008, you know, a guy that was real close to me that was my celly, he was involved in an incident in Hazleton and it ended up in the USA Today. That was in June or July 2008. That was Aaron Pike. Were you there in J June, July 2008, around that time? I didn't get there till Christmas. Oh, so you it's got there after a bunch of, bunch of that stuff happened with uh, the AB dudes and AB, uh, Ohio That's what ABs. I'm saying. Yeah. So, and that's all the horror stories I heard. Yeah. That it's going off at Hazleton. And here I'm going to Hazleton. So when you get there, who approaches you? Do any of the white dudes approach you? Like, hey, who do you run with? Any of that stuff happen? Yeah, when you first get there, um, because uh, especially at the very beginning, especially for a white car, there's very few on the compound. You might have 160 guys on the compound where there's 1,500 people. So you're immediately pulled in wherever you fit in, meaning your car. And sometimes it might mean the, you know, New York or, or down south. And then you got the gang. So I, I was approached by a couple people. And keep in mind, it was an independent yard. Um so immediately I established that I was independent. I was white. I'm going to stay white, but I'm from New Orleans. I'm from that dirty, dirty. So having brother friends and Spanish friends wasn't that new to me, but because of the environment, you can only be so many friends. You can only be so friends. It's just the reality of it. Segregation, call it whatever you want. Um, the races don't mix. And, and that's on all sides. That isn't a, a racist statement. That's just what it is. That's that's how people operate. Whites, blacks, Mexicans, you know, Latinos, whatever. They run with their own. And, and I don't want people to watch the show and they're, oh, man, you know, dudes are racist. No, that's just that's just how things went there. 
Um, Wait, let me, let me, let me, let me, one second. Let me ask you this. In 08, the independents ran that yard. Who had the car? Was it Spike? Spike. Kevin O'Neill. Yeah, he ended up getting stabbed over in um, USP Lee a year or two later. They hit, yep, him, pretty, they I, hit uh, him pretty bad, man. Well, no, 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 no. He got stabbed before that. He got he got hit on the yard in Hazleton. He ended up going to he ended up going over to USP Lee and got hit bad too. I heard. Well, and and you know here here's here's how people go look at that. Spike was a good dude in my book. He was a solid white boy. He. You know, he, he wasn't no rat. He wasn't no, and, and for the most part, he didn't. He wasn't trying to run nothing. He just he, he was a peacekeeper. That's the type of dude he was. So, you know, mad props for for Spike. Um, you know, I could say some horrible shit about some cars. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm gonna hold that opinion. But I, I'll tell you about some. I'll tell you about the good dudes I've met. You know, because you can always hear about. The horrible guys in there. Let me tell you about some good dudes. If you meet a man that's been to penitentiary and he's on the streets, you probably want to meet, and he's doing good, you probably meet one of the most solid people you can deal with. Because when a man goes into these places and walks through hell and walks out and still has compassion for the next man, that's, that says a lot. There's some, I was carried by a lot of good dudes there. Uh, Fry from the, the DGs, Nito from the Serenios. Because I, while I was there, I cooked in the kitchen. Um, and the whole time I was there, I was a head cook. So again, it put me into a different situation where I was respected. I wasn't a shot caller, but I had a little, little stroke. Let me just put it that way. And I never had a problem. And people respected me like they did you, brother. But did you always have that one that's jealous? It ain't nothing else but jealous. And that's the one, and you know as well as I do. You ain't had no problems with no other races. Who the problems are usually with your own people, right? I wasn't gonna say it. I was gonna let you say that. It's all good. I was gonna man. let you say that. But it's the truth. That I mean, that's pretty much who I had issues with, you know. Um, it was always your own people. You and, and you gotta Unfortunately, sometimes you got to do things to them that you don't want to do, or you got to call a shot that you don't want to call. And but you, hey, you hey, self preservation at the end of the day, right? So, how important is food in prison? You were to cook. Well, I got to tell you, there's some dudes that if they were there, they will remember me because I'm from New Orleans. There, but first thing out there, everybody's my oh, you cook, huh? And so, by the graces of God, again. I had worked myself to where the, the I got a little extra leniency when seasoning up the food and trying to dress things up. And so, you know, and, and you can be run off real quick for not doing right by the food. Um, that's how I got the job. Yeah. Um, do one acting right was more, more worried about a hustle than putting out a good meal. And for me, that was a savior that, that gave me some income that, that let me do me and it let me do my Christian walk. And so I just kind of did my own time, my own pro- program. Um, and the bright, bright side for me though, brother, and I know it was for you. And it's the only reason I approached you is helping someone else and see some, something good come from it. See, that's, 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 that's a trait that very few men have. And my, I have nothing but bad respect for you, brother. So well, I appreciate that. I want to. I want to. I want people to realize that in prison, everybody's hustling, right? Everybody's got to hustle, right? Everyone. And the majority of people are hustling so that they can eat. And when I say eat, I mean real food. They want peppers. They want onions. They want to hustle, and they make stamps and they send money home. But they also buy peppers, onions, raw meat. I mean, did you make money out of there? Keep it real. I did. I did absolutely, and never had to take a thing myself. <laughs> <laughs> Because if you if you know how to be around men, you know, alpha men, you know how to work men. And I took care of everybody. I made sure at the end of the day, people up in the bar and the butcher shop were taking care of people. You know, you take care of the different departments and they take care of you. And so that also gave me an end with all the shot callers because they're the ones that want these things. 
And I literally, and it's no exaggeration, when we kick out lunch, I'd stand at the end of the line and the wardens knew what I was doing. But I was handing out onions and peppers and I didn't go crazy with it. Just few here, few there. And they let that go because they knew that's all I wanted, just pepper and onion. I wasn't trying to rob the place. So they allow things for the betterment of things. They know that it's going to do so either they can allow this or it's going to, they're going to try another way. So it's a, it's a give and take thing. It's a respect thing. It's all about respect. If you ain't got respect and don't get respect, don't go. Let me ask you this. Did you ever have to put in any work at Hazleton yourself personally? <laughs> well, and again, I'm not making any disparaging comments about anybody, but the first dude I fought was a sanctioned fight in a cell with a Boston dude. And uh, you know how certain cells go to certain cars and that's where they stay. I had my own cell because I'm the head cook and I just had that privilege. They just didn't put nobody in my cell. I'd get up at three in the morning, had to go to work, so they understood. So I was fortunate to have my own cell. A dude came in off the Boston car and uh, he needed a cell until we get him placed. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So I let him stay in my cell. Well, he tried to take the cell from me. So uh, we had some words and we both went to our shot callers. He went to his, I went to mine and we went to cell. And, um, you know, I, I'm not a badass, but I understand that the walls and all the metal in there are a lot harder than I could hit. So all I did was bang them off the walls. Never had a problem after that. I heard a lot of I heard a lot of old timers say that, man. The concrete hits harder. Oh my God, does it? And and you know you get you know when in Rome you gotta you gotta you gotta be prepared. I'm not a big dude. I'm not that dude. I don't want no problem. But don't come to me because I'll give it to you. What do you think was the most dangerous car when you were at Hazelton? I think as a collective, uh, I think the, the administration understood that the whites were the most dangerous as a collective. Uh, but beyond that, I would say the Serenios. Those dudes are disciplined. It's not even a joke. These guys, we're talking hundreds. These guys get up every morning, do, they roll up their bed, they roll up, they tie up their shit, and they do calisthenics, they do everything together. So I think if I, if you had to go get an army, that's not one that I, you know, the Emmys. And then we had a black hand on the yard too. So it was, uh, it was hardcore. These, those, those some militant dudes. In my perspective, I think they're the most dangerous car in the federal bureau of prisons, bro. They well, will stab it, you, man. It, if their shot caller tells them to hit the warden, they're hitting them, man. It doesn't Oh, it's happen. not a joke. Well, and I'll tell you this, let me show you what happened to me. And this is not that I call the shots or anything, but, I brought a Sereno in the kitchen and he went to getting greedy and hungry and shit. And I had to call him out on it. And a uh, dude called me out in front of everybody. So, and I was about to, we had big paddles in the kitchen and I was going to ding this guy. And truth be told, a black brother and a Muslim brother stopped it and said, nope, 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 nope. Go to shot callers. So, he went to the unit. I went to the unit. We were going to figure this out. And the next day, I went to work, and uh, he had disappeared. Um, they had he, he couldn't stay, and yeah. I had not. You know, I not that I've been anybody, but I think the Serenio start the bigger cause. They got a good thing with going in with this kitchen. They got they're not going to let this this dude this one individual messed that up so well, just as fast as they'll do you they'll do their own you were back you were there back when men respected men you were there when pooch was there probably AD yeah pooch. yeah and then uh i mean you weren't there when that's the incident i was talking about was in the usa today you weren't there when the when the sack kid hit him in the face with a rock or a brick or something but you know there's been some serious things that happened over there and you mentioned you said something about the white dudes being the most dangerous car right um, something that people watching the video that never been in prison before might be like, nah, 
But the problem is that you get white dudes in there, man, that are just viciously violent against their own. Like they will stab their own in the eyes. They will. T- I mean, they did that to, to one of the DWBs at uh, Big Sandy. Mikey X well, stabbed his eyes out, man. Here's a minute. Here's 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 how to look at it. Even the administration, they could see twenty guys over here and not think nothing of it. But if they catch ten white boys over here crunched up, they're looking because they feel like they know that. Like you said, and and don't get me wrong, I don't disrespect any of them. I got mad respect. You do you. You do. I can do me. They're all dangerous. But if I had to say, you know, again. Who, who, you know, you got to understand the history of white gangs. Um, the very history of how white gangs started uh, is vicious. And that's because when they went to prison, they were the minority. And certain groups were taking advantage of the whites. Um, and I'm not going to call races or anything, but so, and there were some whites that just weren't going for that shit. And that's how the white gangs initially started. And it's because the white boy was being handled. You know, they, not a lot of, back in the day, wasn't a lot of people, white people in prison. Yeah. So a lot of bad things happened to a lot of good dudes strictly because they were outnumbered. So it's, yeah. And you, you, you got out, what, 2014, right? Yes, sir. Like I said, you're living your best life. I actually seen your son over there helping you put your computer together for this interview right. and everything. How's it feel to be home and free, man, and be a father, man? Brother, there's nothing, there's nothing that can replace this. And, and I guess what I, the message I try to deliver to anyone is that freedom, you only get it once. And once it's gone, you don't get it back. And the simplest mistake, simplest mistake can change your whole life and i try to tell my friends that are still doing some stupid things do you understand one little mistake and you're gone brother you're gone and forever your life has changed it's not worth it so you know before we go though i want to ask you this did you ever do time in louisiana i did how much time did you do over there i did six years and Give you a little history. It's the only other time I've been in, in trouble. I've never been in trouble in my life. When I turned 18, and this is this, this is why I tell you this, Chad, and to anybody listen, I went with a friend. We tried to buy a little weed. At the end of the night, it turned into an armed robbery and an aggravated battery charge. And that's the truth of the story. I was 18. I was a kid. I pled guilty. And again, even at that time, walked into back in the 80s in Southern prisons, it's way different than anybody can even imagine. And there's a racial tension, and it's a racial tension that's taken out on whites. You got to understand, this very year I went, I don't know if you remember that news guy, that Gary, that guy named Gary that killed that child molester in New Orleans airport. Um, dude that kidnapped his kid, molested him. They brought him back on the plane. Dad standing at the phone, turns around and shoots him. That's back when they used to carry you through the airport. So I went there in a hard time. And when I went, either you went hard. I I, I make no mistake. I've probably stabbed about 10 dudes. And I, I don't make no apology for it. Um, you know, and I, I was called like it is. I was fighting for my manhood. You know, as a young man, they were straight vicious. They've got straight, they've got some predators. That and was, that was many years ago when prison was real. I did a, uh, I wrote an article about Louisiana State Prison after uh, Lester Holt went in there. Yeah. And, and man, just the things that were happening down there, man, not just, you know, not on no racial stuff, not just the white people, but them dudes were in there raping each other, raping other dudes. And it was bad. Dude, and, and, I was there when they were, the guards were getting jacked up because of some of the punks were, in fact, I'll just call it like it is, punk chopped one of them dudes off with his mouth, one of the, a guard. And he tried to say that it was something else, but everybody knew. But 
Back in the 80s, Louisiana was a horrible, and these, even today, these Southern prisons, state prisons, they're horrible. It's, it's, there's some vicious predators out there. And I got to tell you, you know, you know, that was saying, you know, what's worse, put 10 men, uh, release 10 guilty men or put one innocent man in jail, which one's worse? You know, I'd say put the innocent man in jail, but after spending some time in jail, I'd sit there just to make sure some of these mothers burned in hell because they deserve it. It is what it is. You got strong opinions, bro, but you, hey, I respect your opinion, man. You know, and, and I respect all people's opinions. You know, well, and, and when you it's either stand for something or fall for anything, brother. And look at you. You standing proud. You know, it ain't about me. To to it's about it's about the mission, bro. For real. The mission really is to save kids from life imprisonment and premature death. And I mean that, man. You know, well, check this out. I got four boys that are Southern boys. My boys say, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Thank you. And please, you know, Hey, I homeschool my boys. That's what's See? up. Man. I've homeschooled my boys since I got custody of them. Three months after release from federal prison for crossing state line with my kids, Three months after getting out of federal prison, I was given sole custody of those same boys. That's what's up, bro. I'm, I'm happy for you, man, and I'm glad you're living, you know, your best life. Is there anything you want to say before we close? Well, I'd like to take this opportunity. One, there are people out here to see this and see what this man's doing. If you have any compassion they, uh, for guys that are sitting in jail un unlawfully, hit this guy here. In some way, support him. Support the channel because I'm telling you what he does. He's getting dudes out of prison that don't deserve to be there. And if that in itself is in the man that deserves blessings, I don't know what it is. Once you get to prison, society forgets about you. Out of sight, out of mind. And it's a, it's a shame that our criminal system so readily will destroy a man whether he's guilty or not, just so they could get a conviction. And that's that, that's the sad world we live in, brother. Um, it is, man. You know, I'm dealing with Louisiana, like I told you. Louisiana, whoever hears this, is reporting that I'm a convicted first-degree murderer. I'm not. That I admitted to. I'm just joking, brother. I'm just joking. <laughs> it's all good. Listen, man, I'm going to close the show, man. I thank you for coming on. And continue, man, to live your best life, man. Be a real father, a real leader. For those that are hitting the channel, man, hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button. Share the video. I hope you like the message. With respect, until tomorrow, we're out.